happy Monday to everybody. Plug Talk Sports episode 43. It's a two-man crew tonight. It's just me and Janka, who's been trying to get me into anime for the past, I'd say, three years. But it's not working. I'd like to say I'm a very stubborn person. And it's it's not working. And it's not going to work. Uh, and I'm not budging. So I'm going to let him keep on trying. That's fine. I appreciate the effort. I'll, I'll let him keep trying. But I don't think it's going to work. There's been times, I will say, there has been times where I've considered it. I've, I've thought about, hmm, I've been close. But it I'm does, like. It doesn't hurt to try it, bro. If you don't like it, you don't like it. But just try it at least. No, I don't want to give in to you, bro. What's wrong with giving, just giving it to, to your best friend, bro? What, like, what is this? I feel, no. I feel hurt. <laughs> no. Why man. would I recommend you something that you wouldn't like? <laughs> Let's get into uh, – you want to start off with the uh, talking about bad news or good news first? What do you want to talk about first? Whatever you want. All right. Let's do um, – hmm, let's go with good news first. What was the best thing you saw last week? Well, obviously, we're going to be talking about it in a few in a few moments, but it would be UM beating out USC and, and Auburn this weekend to make it to the Sioux 16 for the, I think, third time. In organ in the program history, so and then also women. I'm gonna have to obviously acknowledge UM's women's basketball for making it to the tournament. Also, so. interesting. Yeah, I know both team, both squads have been doing very well, uh, and we'll talk about that um, in, in a few minutes. But uh, for me, it's gonna have to be the Bahrain Grand Prix start to the 2022 Formula One season. Uh, my favorite team, Ferrari, has been struggling um, for the last, you know, a couple, three, four years. But yesterday, oh man, it, I mean, two days ago, should I say, was it yesterday? It was yesterday, was it? I don't even remember anymore. Uh, but Ferrari finishing P1 and P2, uh, Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz finishing first and second. Um, Lewis Hamilton, who's before last year, won seven straight world championships for Mercedes, uh, finished in third. Obviously, last year, Max Verstappen for Red Bull won. But uh, first race of the season goes to Charles Leclerc of Ferrari. They take one and two. So it was a good start to Ferrari. Um, let's talk about the bad uh, the bad, uh, the bad stuff. What, what was the worst thing uh, that happened that you saw last week? Oh, that's tough. Um, bad, bad, bad. Uh, man, I guess it would have to be, you know, just to continue about, I guess, Jordan's basketball, but it would have to be the bad three-point shooting that they're, they're I mean, that's, that's why I can think of that, that happened bad this week. I mean, hmm. I guess you win women's basketball losing to to South Carolina. I think they played well defense, but but South Carolina was, was just a little bit stronger. I've been thinking about this one all day today. I haven't I don't know if there's one thing though that I can say. I mean there is, but it's on the uh it's on the topic list. It was pretty bad. Um, that's Real Madrid, but we'll get into that. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was very bad for me. Uh, but, yeah, that's all I'll say is, is Real Madrid. So, first topic of the evening, Miami Hurricanes advancing to the Sweet 16. What, what's the furthest the Hurricanes in program history? It's the furthest they've ever gone in this tournament. I think it was. Is the elite eight? I think it was the elite eight in 2013. I think it was. If I remember correctly. Uh, li- listen, listen. I- I'll give him this. I didn't think. I this for me looks like a whole brand new team that's playing right now. Like it's it's re-energized. I didn't think that they were going to take out USC. Auburn, I didn't think they were going to take out Auburn, uh, but they took out both teams. So credit to them. I do think this is. I do think that they can. I, I do think they can beat Iowa State. 
Yeah, I do agree. But if they take out Iowa State, here's the problem. They play can they would have to play either Kansas or Providence. I, I think they would probably face Kansas. I'm not too sure they'll beat Kansas. That's my bracket. I have them losing to Kansas. Yeah. I don't think they'll I don't think they'll and even it gets tougher. Like if they beat let's say they beat Kansas, right? Then in the final four, they'll be playing most likely Villanova. Dang. <laughs> hey, hey, this is making it to the final four is is enough recognition for the for the program. Yeah, I don't uh I don't think they'll they'll beat Villanova to be honest. Hey, but you said they weren't gonna beat USC, so I mean this year has been a surprise for for me. Uh, honestly, we beat Duke in, in the middle of the season in January, so I was very surprised. That was a surprise. I, I will say that was a surprise. But you know what, man? Like I feel like the last couple of years, like Duke hasn't been what it's. Once been, it's same with North Carolina. You know what I mean? I feel like both of those squads haven't been their strongest. You think it was because of COVID? No. And, 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 with the NIL, NIL deals, so now like more players want to go to different schools. They don't have to just go to to like the the basic like number one schools like Villanova, Duke, North Carolina, Arizona, Gonzaga. I just – The talent is more spread out. I just – I don't think they've been the strongest. Like, the players that they have on their squad, it hasn't been the strongest. It has been in a couple a couple of years. Because North Carolina did win a national championship in, in recent – but, like, after that, that squad was good. But after that squad, like, it's been – it's been whatever. Yeah. I mean, thing, uh, oh, like, like it's been it's been okay. It hasn't been like oh wow, like this is the Duke we're used to seeing. Yeah, I, understand. I know what you mean, but even though it's not the Duke we're used to seeing, you can look. You can even tell right now they're still winning no matter what. Because they have a coach who has that experience, knows how to win yeah. games, but and they have five star recruits. Yeah, after after this year, man, next year's March Madness for them. They got to get a good coach because Coach K is gone. Going back to the um, yeah. Okay. They, I feel like Iowa State is a is it. They can do something, but I need I need if anybody watches this for for UM basketball, I need them to understand that when you take a lead. You're not supposed to just start chucking up threes, once because you because you have a comfortable lead like by ten. They just start chucking up un unnecessary threes. They start playing like the uh, they're not playing organized basketball anymore. You see, they just like start playing too much ISO. Like um, McGusty, once they they took that ten point lead uh, against Auburn, they started they started throwing little threes. Obviously, for the previous two games, the three hasn't been going in for them. So they kept going. They kept trying. They're not making the threes, which made Auburn be – they were able to come back at the half, 33-32. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Miami, you know, they were able to bring back the lead and, you know, at least hold it for the end of the, most of the game. But they need to if, – if Miami could just continue to play this great defense that we're seeing and forcing – this many turnovers. I think they have like almost fifty turnovers in three games, forced, and shoot the ball well from three. If they can just shoot the ball well from three, continue to just make those layups and free throws and little fadeaways here and there, they can be. They can. They can make it pretty far. I I think the star play, like the person who has. Um gotten everything going for this team on defense and offense. I don't know his first name. Isaiah Wong? Wong. He has really – he's been the star. Like, he's been the lifeline of the team. 
really the, the, on defense and in offense. I don't know. I think I think Charlie Moore. Charlie Moore has been performing well. Bro, that guy, he's a stud. I see him. I always focus on him because I always see him. Okay, what is he gonna do next? I always see him go around the court and backdoor one of the one of the Auburn, or one of the opposing players, and just snatch the ball away like a little like a little rabbit and he all the way down. Yeah, because you know, compare like in basketball size, he's not the tallest. You know who he reminds me of? He reminds me, no, he reminds me of a Kyle Lowry. Okay. That's what he reminds me of. I can see that. Also, who is the – I forgot, number 21, I believe, tall guy? McGusty? Is that is that the center? Oh, do you mean – um? Uh, yeah, what's his name? I know you're talking about. Uh, let me see the roster. He's been playing pretty well. Wardenberg? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Sam Wardenberg. Yeah, he's he's been playing really well. He, he hasn't played really well. at all. The thing is, though, like, I'm not sure if this Miami team has really been like tested. No. The- Two I games. You haven't really seen most of their games, but I saw both games. But I, the I majority don't think they were tested in the Auburn game. No, in the Auburn game, no, because Auburn played terrible. But like, USC, like yeah, like dude, like they, yeah, they had times where like USC got back into it or whatever. But like, I mean, like when you're facing a a team that doesn't let up, like it's just straight like. UM scores when other team comes back scores. And it's just like back and forth the entire game. I don't think they've been tested like that yet. No, they've been they've been tested. Um they 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 when they played Duke in the semifinal, they lost. Real close game. They lost to a close game there. I'm saying in this tournament though. Oh, in the tournament, the tournament just started. But, yeah, but I'm saying through the two games, I, I don't think that they for me, I don't think that they've been like tested to the limit. Oh, I mean, I mean, I guess, I guess, but at the same time, it's like maybe they've been just playing better than their opponents. So, so it kind of helps. I think, and I hope I'm not wrong because I'm looking at Iowa State. They're an 11 seed. Miami's a 10 seed. I do think Miami can beat Iowa State. Hopefully, I'm not wrong, but. Uh, I think if they get past that game, like Kansas is going to be a real test for them. I'm going to be on my chair watching that game. I will not miss that game at all, period. Because what about the, the real – I don't think Miami is the real Cinderella story, though. Who do you have a Cinderella story? Don't say St. Peter's. St. Peter's, man. St. Peter's is the Cinderella story in this tournament. Man. They took out Kentucky. But no. every, year, every year there's that one team. You remember a couple years ago it was Florida Golf Coast? Bro, yeah. And then um, another year it was uh, – what's what's that school's name? Oh. It was last year. What was the name of that school from last year? Loyola, Chicago? They, they, yes. No, but there was one last um, year. Last year? Last year, last year. I got to look this up because... Man, what was the name of that school? Because I I can't. Now it's not going to leave my mind. But there was a, a school last year. Where did, where did they make it? There was a school last year. Oral Roberts? Yes, there we go. Oral Roberts. Last year, Oral Roberts was freaking. No one was like, Oral Roberts is not going to make it anywhere. Who won the thing last year? Was it Gonzaga? 
Was it? Or no, was it Baylor. Baylor. Okay. Baylor's also a one seed. Yeah. They beat Gonzaga last year. Well, I, I think we can we can agree on this one. If Miami's gonna exit, it's gonna be Elite Eight. That's what we think. That's the minimum. That's the. Oh, no, that's our prediction. Like that's what we yeah what we think it's gonna happen. Man, I hope they can prove me wrong, man. If they can get out of the, ooh, I would love it so much. If they can be Kansas. Oh, so I, so I. It'll just yeah. be one more game. Kansas. One more game. You're going to have to beat Kansas. You're going to have to then try to beat Villanova. Bro. That's a tough path, man. Hey, I was um, boys, boys, boys. Credit, credit to FIU, though. Hmm? For, for uh, FIU has not, FIU has not made it, and their only appearance actually in the NCAA tournament was in 1999. Jeez. And they lost by 30 points in the first round to UCLA. Hey, I got UCLA winning it. Like, look, uh, Kansas, they beat Texas Tech. They beat TCU. They beat num- number 21, Texas. This is throughout the season. They beat Baylor. They beat Iowa State. They beat Oklahoma State. They, bro, this team is – they played really good teams. And they've won. Yeah. So, again, we'll agree that if – if – they go out, it'll be Elite Eight. They you need to make their threes. And that whenever they have a lead, they need to play organized basketball. They need to make plays. They need to set picks. They're not doing any of that. They just they, – they, they see they have a lead, but then they start chucking – they start playing lackluster. They just start throwing, throwing, chucking up whatever shots. If you just waste, or just waste the shot clock and make a play, if you miss, you miss. But at least you wasted an entire shot clock – and not letting them get enough time to come back into the game, and you and you continue to play defensively the way you are, their scoring is going to be depleted, and they're going to get tired. But no, they just start chucking up threes, and then now, which gives them a time to have to make go on these seven zero runs, which ruins yeah. all the offense that you just just put in like like two seconds ago. I think we'll leave it at that. I think we can agree if they're going to exit, it's going to be Elite Eight. Hopefully not. Moving on. This was a, this was a dagger. This was a surprise for me. Bang, bang. El Clásico yesterday, Real Madrid taking on Barcelona. Biggest, obviously, biggest one of the biggest games in the world, biggest rivalries in the world. Uh, Barcelona. In the Santiago Bernabeu, and Madrid takes home a 4-0 result. Uh, and I think many people were surprised, shocked uh, because of this. Um, I'll give my take. I, I I like Carlo Ancelotti as a coach for Real Madrid, um, but I don't think that his tactics worked yesterday. Aside from it being a bad day for Real Madrid, and they picked a bad day to have a bad day, because uh, overall, everyone on the field was just not playing good and playing to the level that we are used to seeing. Um, but they were missing Kareem Benzema due to a calf injury, and obviously Real Madrid has about a 12-point lead over Barcelona and La Liga. There's only about nine games left. Real Madrid pretty much has that sealed in the bag. They're going to be La Liga champions. Um they're focusing towards their Champions League tie coming up in April against Chelsea. So Madrid decided that we're going to rest Benzema with this calf injury uh, to save him for that game against che- those two games against Chelsea. Um, so that means Ancelotti brought in Luka Modric as a center forward out of the midfield. And when he did that, what that did was that left. We know that Modric plays in a central midfield role. That left a gaping hole 
in the central midfield. And I think after 15 minutes, Modric realized that and then dropped back. But it didn't help either because when he dropped back, then that left a gaping hole in the central forward position. And then you had Rodrigo and Vinicius Jr. on the wings and nobody was in the middle. So like Modric had to freaking run the entire field between am I a center forward or I'm going to be in the midfield. So that tactic was really bad. Um, you know, I'm not sure. Like Rodrigo is good. Obviously, it would have started Vinicius Jr. as he did. But I probably would have liked to see Marco Asensio in the game earlier. Surprise. Him. The defense, as soon as the second goal happened, you didn't even need the second goal. Through the first goal, we saw how poor Madrid defense was. You should have sub. There was no Furlan Mendy either. You should have subbed in Eduardo Camavinga into the game to help, but he didn't. And then, of course, they go 2 0 up. And it was just very poor defending. David Alaba, who's usually a fantastic defender. Played like crap as well. Uh, Edward Militao, another Madrid defender, played like crap as well. It was just an overall bad day for Madrid. There was no really... The only type of attack they had is when they used Vinicius Jr.'s speed. um, But he couldn't get anything done. Obviously, he's coming off with a flank. And then he looks to the middle and there's nobody there. There's just an empty hole because Modric, you know, obviously has to be running in the entire field pretty much. Uh, and mind you, Modric is not, I mean, he, Modric can still play, but he is not the youngest guy anymore. Um, so I think tactically it wasn't good and they lost because of it and lost because of everyone's poor play. Uh, but it doesn't hurt Madrid. They're still up 11, 12 points in La Liga. They still have Champions League to play for. Congratulations. Barcelona gets three points. They haven't beaten Real Madrid since 2019. So a good three years there that they haven't beaten Real Madrid. They get their win. And they just have the Europa League to play for because they're not in contention for La Liga. They're not in contention for Copa del Rey. They're not in contention for Spanish Super Cup. Um, And, you know, the whole thing of people saying, oh, Xavi is one of the best coaches in the world. The guy just took over Barcelona four months ago. And yes, he's putting together, I will say he's putting together a nice piece of, you know, winning streak, a winning streak here. But let's not forget, beginning of the season to halfway and even a little bit of halfway, this Barcelona team was horrible. So just because they beat Real Madrid 4-0 doesn't mean that now he's one of the best coaches in the entire world. Uh, and that's my take on that. Okay. I didn't watch the game. I didn't know that the Glasgow was on yesterday, to be honest. But I saw your story, and then, oh, you're watching the Glasgow. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. I was I was on PlayStation. My brother told me that Fortnite was on. They, they stopped building. So I was like, all right, let me play. So I went to go check the score. It was 1-0. It was a header, I think. Then all of a sudden, a couple minutes later, it was 2-0. Then three zero, yeah, and then four zero. I was like, wait, 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 this can't be right. And then I saw, and I saw the highlights. Man, you guys, I don't know what happened in the box, but that was terrible defending. Every time they got, every time Barcelona pushed up at the ball, they had all the space and time in the world. And Courtois had some nice saves, but he did what he could. I mean, at yeah. a certain point, you know, like. There's nothing else more that you can do. And, but again, congratulations, Barcelona. You got three points. I hope you guys enjoyed the moment. Uh, but uh, Real Madrid, they got to get regroup, get their stuff together. Um, there's bigger things to play for. We know we got La Liga in the bag. Uh, Champions League, you know, has always been a main focus for Real Madrid, becoming champions of Europe. Obviously, they're the club that's won it the most times in history. In 13, um, and uh, they ha- they're playing a Chelsea team who actually 
eliminated them last season from the Champions League in the semifinal. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. But just a horrible overall performance. And there was pictures of Kareem Benzema. Obviously, he was at the game. Obviously, he couldn't play. He was at the game in the in the in the skybox, the suite or whatever, and chilling there. He looked so frustrated and looked like he really wanted to play. Yeah, he he was like, "What the hell am I watching?" Like, and it's crazy because this is a team last week that overcame a two-zero deficit against PSG in the Champions League, and then you see what you know. You take that, and then you see how they played against Barcelona, and it's like. Wow, I just completely watched two different like teams, but it's the same players. Uh, so I, I think it was just, I think it was just a bad day. But unfortunately, they they picked a bad day to have a bad day because yeah. it was against their rivals. It happens. That was still the best of us. It happens, yeah. Um, sticking to soccer. The two Miami teams lost this weekend. Which one do you want to talk about first? Yeah, I'm too, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be honest here. Lo do equipo. Tiene que irse. Well, I, well, hey, one is better than the other, though. I'm not gonna lie. Which one? Which one is the better one? Miami FC. Oof. I would have to. I, would, I, would. I think yeah. Miami FC is better ten times overall. Man, is that they're both so bad. Uh, Miami FC has gotten a lot better in recent times. They won a championship. Uh, they won the first game. Sadly, the, this, the game that they lost this weekend, they were playing a team in Louisville City who legit has been to the conference finals the last, like, seven years. Okay. So it was a respectable team to lose. I guess I'll say Miami FC for now. But I think didn't Inter Miami lose to Cincinnati, right? The new team that came out? No. Cincinnati's been there for a couple of years already. Charlotte's the new team that came oh, out. Sorry, okay. Which this is that. So I guess I guess we'll talk about Inter Miami first. But here's here's the bad thing, man. Inter Miami holds the record for an expansion team. Losing, it's like it took Inter Miami, I believe, five games to finally get a win in their expansion year of 2020. Charlotte won before Inter Miami did in their, this is Charlotte's expansion year. And that left, this is an expansion team. That left, this is year three for Inter Miami. That left Inter Miami in last place in 14th. Mm-hmm. The Eastern Conference with only one point, which was a draw opening night against the Chicago yeah. Fire, who, mind you, the Chicago Fire have not lost, and they're in second place of the Eastern Conference. <clears throat> I'm going to dive deeper into their problems. Go ahead, dive deeper. There's nothing, there's nothing to go back up for. Listen. You know, at first, I used to be very critical of Gonzalo Higuain. But now, I see some, I see it differently. <laughs> I see it differently. You know why? You just see the struggles? Because when he gets the ball, he is the most accurate passer on the team, and he drops the ball. Exactly where he needs to be. Rather. The problem is, is that he is not set up to succeed. He is not, everyone else around him is like young kids, mind you, because that's the only money they have is to spend on young kids because of the sanctions. Kids at the college, mind you, like, you're talking about Gonzalo Higuain, who's played for Real Madrid, who's played for Chelsea. Like, legit, two years ago, the man was in Juventus playing with Cristiano Ronaldo. Like, the man went from passing the ball or playing with Cristiano Ronaldo next to him to playing with freaking Robbie Robinson, Gambana, and Ariel Lasseter. Uh-huh. Imagine how bad, like, playing freaking 
European stadiums to freaking playing in Dry Pink Stadium in Fort Lauderdale. I don't think that what Iguain was sold on and convinced of when they brought him here that made him say, okay, yeah, I'll join. That yeah. is not what – that is not – yeah, okay. He is – Definitely getting some good money. But then you have Phil Neville publicly dragging him through the mud and saying that it's his fault. Because let me explain it to you, Janka. Gonzalo Higuain, for 25 years of his career, has been a forward. Mm -hmm. Phil Neville is playing him as a number 10, which is the distributor. So Neville also said, oh, but I, I need him to score goals. But you're asking so much of the guy. You're asking him to drop back all the way to the midfield, get the ball, create chances, and score the goals. Like, that is why in this in the last game, not the Cincinnati game, but the one against LAFC, Iguain was subbed off at the 68th minute because the guy was gassed. Like he couldn't anymore. Like you're asking him to pretty much do everything offensively. And it's because there's nobody on the field that is creative. Like the midfield's not creative. Nobody on that field is creative. The only creative person there is Iguain. That's it. He's got no team to play with him. No team. And then, you know, Phil Neville takes that and blames it on Iguain. But I think that is an excuse to deflect the blame off of himself. Because he's played... Breck Shea is not a defender. And he has played... Breck Shea twice as a defender so far this year. Bro, Breck Shea is my guy. This guy, I'm sorry, but he's been he's been hopelessly lost since they put him as a defender. Like the first goal LAFC scored two weeks ago, Breck Shea was lost. He couldn't find the ball, and the guy went right by him. Then, in another instance in that same game, he was like sort of like sleepwalking. Guy ran right by him. Then he noticed when it was too late that the guy was making a run. Gets the ball, and Breck Shea grabs his shirt, pulls him down, straight red card, Breck Shea's out of the game. So, and Breck is not young. Breck is up there in age already. And it's like, Phil Neville, why the hell are you playing somebody who is not, first of all, not naturally a defender and is not young anymore? Why are you putting him in the defender position? It makes no sense. And then you have, again, the players you do have, they're going to take time to develop. It's going to take time. The goalkeeper position is getting worse. So Nick Marsman, who picked up a, he picked up a knee injury last year in the last game of the season, had knee surgery. He still hasn't fully recovered yet, so he hasn't been playing. So that brought in Clement Diop, who's been the goalie so far. But he got hurt. So now he's out. So now they're playing on third string Drake Callender, who made some crucial mistakes in the game against Cincinnati and cost them some goals. And then that was Drake Callender's, by the way, first MLS game. That was his debut. So you're playing on your third string right now, and your backup just got signed because you're down two keepers. And Diop is not supposed to come back until six to eight weeks from now. Damn. So, and you're still waiting for Marsman to heal up from the knee surgery. So they're in a pretty bad spot. And I... The last home game was against LAFC. The attendance was only 7,000. There was 11,000 tickets sold, but <clears throat> tickets scanned actually was 7,000. And it's just... I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
Janka, they might go winless. Like the fact that they they might go winless in April, and I don't know how long they can keep up holding on to Phil Neville. Let me read you the the schedule that they have. Based based on what you've said so far, uh, about the how these players are put in different positions, it's kind of like Phil Neville is just like, uh, I guess like I don't know how he's it. He's just throwing them into these new posi- to this to these positions that they've never played before, and hoping that they they that it will work out. Let me let me tell you this. Listen to this. This is the April schedule for Inter Miami. The Houston Dy- Houston Dynamo. They could get they could get a draw. They could. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but they could. That's all I'm giving them. Then they play the New England Revolution. Then they play the Seattle Sounders. Then they play Atlanta United. And then to finish off April, they play the New England Revolution again. Then you go to May, right? The only game, and now I don't even know anymore. To be honest, I don't even know anymore. Starting off May, they play Charlotte. But now I don't even know anymore because Charlotte Charlotte beat New England. So I'm not even sure. So then you have Charlotte. Then you have D.C. United. Okay. Then you have the Philadelphia Union, who's leading. Hey. You have the Eastern Conference right now. They're leading the East. Then you have the New York Red Bulls. And then you have the Portland Timbers. So in two months, April and May, you're only looking at one game where you can say, all right, they have a chance to win. Like that is bad. And like just even the game against Cincinnati. And, you know, now you're seeing less and less people go to the stadium. April 7th, the vote, which got delayed again for the third time, is on April 7th for Miami Freedom Park. You look at these results, because I think the results matter. What are the commissioners going to say? Are we going to approve all this land, all this stadium to get this? This is what we're going to get? I mean, I understand what the, what the commissioners, if they, that side of the argument makes sense. It's like, why would we give you a, a stadium or land for the stadium if you're just going to keep losing? But at the same time, it all, it's also about money. It's like, okay, if the stadium is put closer. Sorry, my bad. Sorry, something happened. Okay. Um, if the stadium is put closer to the, to the fans, like Mel Reese or – Tropical Park or whatever, somewhere yeah. it's actually in the city in, of Miami, like you know, in the middle where where the actual people want to go and they, the majority of people want to watch soccer. I guess that would bring a lot a more, I guess, like traffic for the stadium. I guess if you could say that, because I think everybody's are. I think everybody till now is already fed up about driving all the way to Fort Casapinga. Listen to me. Listen to me. Even if they get Miami Freedom Park, if the team is still the same, it's going to be empty because just just how Miami fans are. Look at the Marlins. They have a beautiful stadium, but people don't go because the team does not win. I'm, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm thinking about writing a letter to the, to the owner of, of, the, of the Marlins and ask, hey, just share the park with the team. And it'll bring you more revenue, bro. You have people coming into the stadium. There's a problem, though. MLS season runs the same time as as MLB season. I mean, maybe they can also – they can try to work out, like, okay, you know, whenever you have – we'll set up our away games, and then whenever you're not playing, you know, we'll play on a day that you don't play. We'll just try to schedule it. Now, we have that issue with the defending champions, which we saw. 
uh, New York City FC. Uh, they play at Yankee Stadium. And a lot of times, sometimes they have to reschedule games at other stadiums in the area because the Yankees have a game, happen yeah. to have a game on the same day. Like We're not the only ones with the same problem. So I don't see what, what the big deal is about sharing the stadium. Yes, I know Miami can kind of be a headache sometimes, but, you know, if, if you're trying to work out, instead of, you know, making an entirely new stadium, having to deal with all these corrupt-ass commissioners, why not just share the stadium? You know, your team, Marlins trash. Okay, right now, Inter Miami is trash. Okay, share the stadium. You, you both have enough land for it. And if, let's say, Beckham and and Moss want to pay for the land or pay for, like, the maintenance, okay, let them do that. It was like, why Why would that be a burden on you? Yeah. And if they organize their schedule, I don't see what the problem is. I really don't see it. That That's my thoughts on, on Inter Miami. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts on how this has transpired, especially this uh, this opening of the season. Look, I'll tell you this before you, you start. It's only been four games, and it looks like this team has already collapsed. I feel we they need a fresh perspective. I think, personally, I don't know them personally. I don't know him personally, but Phil Neville, or I think that's his name, right? Phil Neville? Yes. He has to go. As much as I don't, as much as I don't know him, I don't nothing against him. I think we've seen enough till no, now. He's a nice guy, obviously. You know, for me, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. I don't, I don't wanna, but I don't at the end of the day, bro, like you know, like you know, business is business. And if you're not winning games, like wins are wins, losses are losses. It shows, but till now, but with everything that's happened so far, I would say just. Cut your losses, bring in a fresh set of a fresh set of people, a new coaching staff. You know, may, they give these players some like some like a new a fresh faces, a new attitude. They'll be motivated. And, okay, you know we have new people. Let's let's try it. Let's try this now. Now you can fix the problems. You ask the players, what do you think the problem is? Like you you let them express their emotions, and then you see how you can fix the problem. And how can you fix what what they want to do? Maybe maybe to help them perform better on the field. So if let's say, like you were saying, Iguain, right? He's been put in as a as a distributor, but he's a but he's usually a forward. Like okay, if he if he to express that problem to the new coach, for for example, okay, so you know what? Let's fix that. I'm gonna put you as how you normally were a forward, whatever. Now. Let's leave the distributing part to somebody else. And then that person will now in practice practicing his passes. Now now there's now there's evolution in the team. Now there's people, you know, people are trying new things. New people are coming in. Like let's say you don't have a, a good distributor, okay? You bring somebody in from like a, a from a from a division that I guess or, or you're gonna trade or maybe from a teenage level team, you bring him in, you train him. I don't know. You start building on something, but it just—it kind of seems like Phil Neville is just all right. You are, what are you, goalie? All right, I'm gonna put you. I'm gonna put you at midfielder. <laughs> yeah, 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 go, 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 do it. Just don't use your hands, though. He just—he's just putting in players just to fill in these spots and hoping that they, like, they're like Forrest Gump, that they can miraculously just come out walking and running. Yeah, bro. He look for me. And you know, in soccer, and probably I think in any sport, to be honest, if you were getting these type of results, it's time to go. It is time to go. Like, if this was a big club, you're talking about like United, Manchester United, like Real Madrid, Barcelona, like, bro, you wouldn't have even lasted a month with these results. You would have been sacked. You would have been gone. Put me in as goalie. <laughs> We already discussed Miami FC. Their issue was uh, there was a lack of creativity. Uh, they had the speed, but there was a lack of creativity, and not they couldn't hang on to possession, especially in the final third. And then they were play, uh, playing in Louisville. They're playing a Louisville team that has been very successful in the last uh, last years and in recent years. They were the team that eliminated Miami FC from the playoffs last year. 
Uh, so it was just a, a tough, tough weekend for um, for soccer overall here in in Miami. It was just it was just rough. But we'll talk about the other football now, Miami Dolphins. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, we get ready, buddy. I I don't know what that's supposed to mean, but like I'm not hating the moves that they've done. You you can go first. I got a lot to say. I got a lot to say. Look, I, I, was, I got a lot to say. So you say what you want to say, and uh, you and then I'll go. Just to, just to like let me cool off a bit because the Miami Marlins right, the Miami Dolphins right now, it's time in, in yellow fino. I can say that. They so. I will say that they uh, they've been getting everyone from Dallas that worked for Dallas and said, "Hey, come on over!" And like they've got an offensive line. They got Cedric Wilson. Uh, yeah, just everyone that they've worked for other teams. I know that probably doesn't make sense because free agents be like, they've gotten a couple of Cowboy players. I believe three or four Cowboy players. They're like, yo, just come on over here. Uh, I'm not hating on the moves. They signed a running back from San Francisco. No, sure, yeah. I, I'm not hating it. I I want to know your opinion, though. Like, I want to know why it's – why they've, why they've I'm assuming they're bad moves. Okay. I am not saying that the players that they acquired are bad. They're not bad. They're just average. Okay. They're average players. But my problem is that this team has been either average or below average for, like, the past, like, I don't know how many years. They can't seem to get a a big pickup. And no matter what offseason they have, no, there, there's not a single player that they can't. They could have gone Devonte Adams for Tua. Wouldn't that be a good pickup? Nah, sight didn't happen. They had Mike Williams coming out of the Chargers, rookie deal. He had a phenomenal season. Nah, sight they couldn't get him on a rookie deal. Nah, no, nah, didn't happen. They could they could have picked up uh, what's his name? Uh, Mari Cooper, nah. That's true. Who else was who else is a wide receiver they could have picked up? Like, okay, Jarvis Landry right now, he could be going back. To, he could he could have a chance to go back to the Dolphins, but it's not looking that likely. Like, the whole problem for Tua is that he has nobody to throw it to. They have Jalen Waddle. They have Gasecki. But besides them too, they don't really don't have anybody else. Yeah, but the problem is they have no O line. If you have no O line, why are you, why are you signing running backs? Explain that to me, Daniel. Explain that to me. If you have a bad O line, why are you getting running backs? How can you run? How can the guy run through the O line if your O line is trash? Watch the Dolphins gonna be the worst. Are gonna be the worst rushing team in the league. Watch AFC. You see it. They'll be last place because they can't do anything. Yeah. Now that I think about it, you're not wrong. You have Gaskin. You had the other the other dude before him. That's how he, they're not bad at all. They're just. Did they, did they keep Duke Johnson? Duke Johnson just signed with um, bro. The bro. I, I swear to God, I swear to God, I'm not even lying. I'm not even lying. I, I, had, I had a year. Two Johnson signed with somebody. I think he signed with the Raiders or something. Oh, Raiders are looking nice, though. Buffalo Bills. I mean, the, AFC, the AFC East rival, he signed with them. And he did, and he did good this, this season with the Dolphins. You could have him. I'll give you it. I'll give you this. That one guy they signed from Dallas is on the line, but he does get penalized a lot. Collins? No, they didn't get Collins. They got another guy. 
I forgot his name. But he does get he like he's good, but he gets penalized a lot. Hmm, let me see. Miami just lost to Philly. The Heat? Yeah. What was the score? Uh 113. Right, 136, yeah. Damn. They gotta finish out the season strong. Hmm. But yeah, it, he gets penalized a lot, so I don't know well, how that. Is. Have I agree. Celtic red wine from you. Let's go. Um, they got um, they signed fullback Alec Ingold, offensive lineman Connor Williams. Yep, Ronnie that's him. Chase Edmonds, quarterback Teddy Bridgewater. Hmm. Moster Cedric Wilson. That was a nice pickup. They got Emmanuel Agba, Preston Williams. I don't know who who the Dolphin player is, but listen, you're right. They got all these people, but they're not ad- addressing the, the the main pressing issue, which is the offensive line. They got one person. And that one person, I can tell you from watching the Cowboys, because that's my team, he gets penalized a lot. So, and that's just one person. They're not really fixing the issue. If if your O line is the problem, and you're run, and you're getting running backs, okay, you have running backs now. Okay, now let's move on to to the quarterback. If the quarterback couldn't do anything with that with that trash offensive line, what is getting running backs going to help you do, bro? Okay, you're gonna, well, you're gonna make Tua run the option. Okay, let's run the option. Okay, he stays with the ball. Boom, sack. Oh, another ten yards. Boom, sack. Another ten yards. Fumble could be a fumble. He throws interceptions. Yeah, okay. you can have anyone back there, and we've seen this with the Cowboys' like offensive line of how great they've been over the years. But you can have anyone back there. And if you have a good offensive – you remember DeMarco Murray? Like, bro, nobody knew who DeMarco Murray was, but they had the freaking best offensive line in football. Exactly. And the freaking guy went crazy for running yards. But if you had a bad offensive line, you're going to get killed no matter who you are back there. I was talking to my brother, and I was telling I was, I was telling him this. Look, these are the names of the AFC quarterbacks so far. Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, Russell Wilson, Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson. Trevor Lawrence, Mac Jones, Derek Carr, Ryan Tannehill, Zach Wilson, Justin Herbert, and now with the with the Colts, uh, Matt Ryan. Matt Ryan. So let's include that in there. Okay, now you seen you just read that list. All, it's all AFC. Now this one, like, I'm gonna say before I even say anything after I was about to say. I I think everybody in Miami that you know. That go that's against the Dolphins. That I f- we would like to see them succeed. We want them to succeed, but it's just the continuation of failure after failure after failure. It just makes us not want to watch them. We we want them to do good. We like it's not like like if they have a good game, right? We cheer for them no matter what, even though they're not our team. Like we like no matter even the Marlins like we we know the Marlins suck. Yeah, you're the Dodgers. I'm a Yankees. But if the Marlins start to win, obviously we'll go for the Marlins, right? Yeah. Like, even, okay. I mean, I'd be happy for them. Yeah, exactly. Like we, but it's just oh my god, this fate. So much failure. So much failure. Like, it's the thing is like there's teams yeah like there's gonna be a cycle because sports is like a cycle like there's gonna be a cycle where your team is not good but eventually you get out of that cycle though right it's like the Marlins are that never ending and same with the Dolphins like never ending cycle where they don't get out of it I I can I the Marlins I'll give them a break because they won in '97 and 2003 I'll give them a break for that even though it's been a while already it's been 19 years but. I'll give him a break for that because baseball's really hard to win. Yeah. But I can also put the blame on the Marlins because they get rid of all their good players. But you know that's a, that's an argument for a different day. Yeah. But 
what I have a question, I would love to just just uh interview the new Dolphins, uh the new Dolphins head coach, and even like maybe there's just the whole entire organization that runs the team, and and read those names out again like I did, and tell them okay, explain to me with everything you've done this this off season, how you're gonna beat these 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 uh these quarterbacks, and in the playoffs only eight of them can make it. Go explain it to me. How do you expect? How do you expect to be all these all these teams and make it in the top eight? He said, "Well, you know, I, I think we have a great team." Yeah, we have a great team. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like, oh, you know, I visited your your city one day on a tour. You guys said you were going to make the Super Bowl at home. That was two like two years ago, right? Yeah, yeah it was when they, before they were setting up for the. The Super Bowl. Yeah. I think, dude, I think that was actually right before. I think that was, yeah, that was a month before everything shut down. I think it was, no, I think it was the year before that. I think it was the year before that. No, that Super Bowl was 2020. I can tell you right now. I have a picture. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it was 2020. Because I remember Kobe died. 2018. 2019? 2018. The Super Bowl wasn't in Miami in 2018? No, no, like the the tour was in 2018. Oh. We were talking about getting people to buy tickets because they were like, they were like oh, the Dolphins watch. The Dolphins are going to be the first team ever to play at their home stadium. And I was like, ah, you thought – Cracking up in the middle of the thing. Everybody was talking. See, look, 2018. Okay. Yeah, it's it, the Super Bowl there was 2020. I remember Kobe died that week. Kobe died that week. And then the Super Bowl was the, the weekend after. I remember we went to the shows and stuff like that. And it was not the same, obviously, because the atmosphere was all ruined because of Kobe. And even that Super Bowl didn't even feel like Super Bowl because everyone was just like down about Kobe. And then I remember the month after, because that was February, the month after everything shut down because of COVID. Yeah. Crazy, man. 12, I think. Yeah, I, I still remember. Like, that's another conversation for another day. I still remember how that how that all happened. I was actually still working at FIU. I was in the middle of a baseball game. And I remember getting the note. I was commentating. I remember getting a notification saying NBA has canceled the season. And start talking about like Rudy Gobert testing positive. I remember him like two days before, like touching all the microphones. And then I was like, wow, this is getting pretty serious. Like, wow, they're canceling NBA. And then I remember two days later, I was in another, I was supposed to do an FIU baseball game, and they were like, oh, we're canceling the season. Like, we're done. So it was just crazy. Like, and they're actually talking about that there's a variant, uh, yeah. a spring outbreak they're talking about. So uh, just like there was during Christmas when I eventually fell and I got COVID, I was no longer uh, a survivor. I was I was surviving for so long <laughs> and then finally I got it. But uh, they're saying there's going to be another outbreak like that, like there was in, in Christmas. Uh, there will be in spring with this new variant. But uh, anyways... We've reached uh, we've reached our limit uh, on today's on tonight's episode. It was very insightful. Me and Janka, of course, we always talk like we're we're on camera and stuff like that. But this is a conversation like we talk like our normal everyday sports conversation. We're not on camera, so that's what it feels like. But uh, thank you guys again for for tuning in. We appreciate you guys and go to our website. We got great articles out there. Uh, Janka just wrote one. It's going to be posted tomorrow. Um, and again, check out our website. A lot of great articles from our entire team, not just myself, not just Janka, but Anya, Alan, Brandon, Isaac. Uh, we appreciate their work, and we appreciate you guys tuning in and listening and, and watching the show and reading. And uh, we'll catch you guys next week for a brand-new episode. Good night, everybody, and have a great rest of your week. Peace.